3. Triumph Tepeclan's masses were moved to celebration by few things. Sholoshaitians were a tempered and restrained people, their culture one which prized nothing more or less than iron self-discipline, and an undying loyalty to family, folk, and Tlatoani. Their fables, when civilian in nature, were of ordinary commoners thrust into the light of greatness by acts of selflessness, who then declined wealth and aggrandizement in favor of a simple life filled by devotion and responsibility. Every one of them, though, from the leanest beggar to the fattest factory overseer, had the embers of war simmering in their chests. Each legend of civilian modesty was preceded by acts of martial bravery, strength, and heroism. The heroes of those myths and mythologized histories were as saints to their kindred. The honored warriors of such stories, as befitted the dour and Spartan moods of the nation, would retire to a simple life void of the pleasures of excess or renown, content with having proved loyalty and fidelity. The warriors of Sholoshaidi were the scions of the principal god of their nation, and it was to he alone that they showed unconditional admiration. All but the most craven and antisocial of the capital's denizens, whatever their professions and pursuits, looked upon loyalty and bravery in the course of battle as the noblest virtue, and service under arms as the highest profession. Consequently, any assembly of these heroes under the imperial standard on victorious parade, or triumph, was enough to bring the city into a frenzy. Rumors of the heirs halt for recovery at a modest hospital in the rugged highland towns just south of the city had swept the streets of Tepeclan for over a month, fed by news of imperial envoys being driven under escort out through the arid countryside into the hills for destinations unknown. A tight leash had been kept on newspaper coverage of the prince's condition, and media access to the suburbs of the city had been closely monitored. After the young man's exploits during the battle for Estlan, the population was hungry for any morsel of news, and an absence of sources had left speculation to run wild. Some claimed the heir apparent was at death's door, while others attested that the nation's future Tlatawani had sustained so dire an injury that he would never walk again. Information milked from suburbanites in the hill towns down south by curious souls in the good graces of power tempered these rumors, with another contingent speculating that this rest period was simply a precaution to ensure the prince looked imposing and healthy when marching in his coming triumph, set to begin eight weeks after the recapture of Estlan. Only a scarce few could have known the details of his injury but even fewer would have predicted the lengths to which the heir apparent would go to stoke the fires of Sholoshaitian pride. The core of the venerable city of Tepeclan rested in a mighty system of canyons feeding a central, miles-wide crater, and its vast overhangs of jutting stone cast the entire lantern-lit metropolis in sulky, ominous shadow. Down these canyons wound meandering aqueducts which bound the banks of streams that swelled to rivers during the rare rains that struck the highland desert. Just one of these canyons allowed access to the city from the rocky plains above, its walls lined with some of the oldest and best-preserved homes and storefronts in the empire. At the terminus of this canyon on the eastern edge of the crater, the yawning expanse of the great temple plaza awaited behind the old gates of the city, whose towering adjoining panels were proudly pockmarked by the scars of sieges now a millennium gone. This was where most had gathered for the day's festivities, their revelries lit in the half-light of the heavily shaded crater by torches and bonfires, and scored by fireworks, laughter, and song. Carts and food vendors plied the crowd, Old soldiers smoked against lampposts and retaining walls as they swapped stories, and children chased one another through the winding streets and roiling masses. The temple plaza, as was ever the case before a triumph, had taken on the raucous atmosphere of a festival. 
flanked by both new concrete high-rises and angular megaliths from religious devotees of old. The ten-mile-long and half-mile-wide causeway through the temple plaza ran straight up to the foot of Shahuitzul, the mountainous pyramid of Harakwe. Its soaring height eclipsed even the mightiest skyscrapers in the crater, and its sweeping frontal steps adjoined perfectly with the worn black marble of the central causeway, seamlessly meshing it with the grim city over which it presided. The jewel of Tepeclan, its construction had taken just under a century despite its size, and the final stone had been laid more than forty centuries ago. Not a soul in the empire could gaze upon its titanic silhouette as they rode into the city's central crater and refrain from shivering before its splendor. The harshest of foreign dignitaries could do little to suppress awe at the age and grandiosity of the civilization with which they meant to treat. In its godly shadow, Ichtak VI would make his entrance. When the great wood horns of the ancient gatehouse to the causeway rumbled, and the horde of captive enemy combatants came tumbling across their threshold like a ragged wave just after dawn. The procession could have been mistaken for any other triumph. These sacrifices would always be the first to enter the gaze of Harakwe on the approach to Shahuitzul, a promise to sate his bottomless hunger. Then followed the honored dead of the Ektal, laid placid beneath the black and gold flags of the Empire upon gilded carts drawn by young acolytes of the priesthood, bound for Lake Tepeclan beyond the temple, where they might be laid to rest. When the tale of this solemn procession passed, and it was not Ichtak VI himself who ushered the victor's spoils towards the temple, though, it became evident something unusual was happening. Unshod and barefoot in recognition of their triumphant return, it was the ranked lines of Tepeclan's Ektal legionnaires who stood as first presenters of this bounty, the soles of their naked feet drumming the stone in practiced unison, captives hustling on tired legs to keep ahead. Rifles shouldered, uniforms immaculate, and golden Triskelion banners dancing gracefully in the air overhead, their appearance sent the roars of the crowd all the higher, combat and support personnel alike sharing in the adulation. Only after several hours of thundering advance, when the hordes of Southland Lautani prisoners had made their ascent of the temple, and the ranks of the parade-dressed Ektal had formed a great living corridor running the length of the causeway, did the prince reveal himself. Ichtak VI rode into view through the gates upon a chariot pulled by a team of Sholushaitian stallions, an ancient breed painstakingly reared to mimic the hairlessness of their Sholushaitian masters. While his steeds were a statement of tradition, his platform bucked that tradition, playing host to more than royalty. To his right upon the chariot stood High Marshal Ruhalpa's unmistakably lean Kandari frame and to his left stood the tall and grim Ektal Legate Tlaloc, advisor to the prince in the field and joint commander of his legion during the siege. Flanking the chariot, mounted upon the finest stallions the Empire's cavalry could produce, rode more than two hundred commissioned officers of the Ektal legions, all in step with the chariot team of their prince. All were stripped to the waist, their stony gray flesh decorated by painted golden sigils and symbols of the old Sholashaitian script. Their wrists and ankles were girded by bracers of gold inlaid with obsidian triskelions, and their heads sported shining crests resplendent with the colors of highland terror birds, whose giant black and yellow feathers formed their fans. Their hairless mounts struck a similarly ancient image with feathered binders and runic script making them look like the steeds of a storied knightly order, pulled from legendary centuries long buried beneath intervening ages. Upon seeing the core of the Ektal's pacification force so honorably placed alongside their prince, one man amongst equals in conquest, the people of Sholoshaidi were set ablaze. Humility before the soldiery, so revered in Sholoshaitian myth, had seldom so visibly been embraced by so celebrated and newly minted 
a hero. Rarely were the first tentative steps to battlefield prominence by any single Sholushaitian downplayed to this extent, much less those of the Tlatawani and their heirs. Such early displays of modesty were considered risky for the nascent renown of any rising young ruler. If this had posed any risk of belittling the prince's standing, his bearing alone swept failure away. The very injury which maimed their one-eyed god mirrored dark and angry beneath balm and stitching upon the prince's face, his focus absolute, his expression iron. If a gamble it had been, then it was a winning one. When, banners waving and crowds shouting, the procession finally arrived at the foot of the great stairway and dismounted, the ceremonial relinquishing of weapons was made and the whole of the group touched their snouts to the stone in deference to the god of war. Each talk alone climbed the steps behind the captured offerings which had preceded him. Hushed now in reverence for Shahuitzul, the crowd watched on for over an hour, the long and steep ascent of the mighty structure a climb that would test the most vigorous soul. Seeming to crouch low over the gathered masses like a sleeping giant ready to waken, the pyramid gave an impression that approached both dread and joy, both threat and welcome. Here were embodied all the hopes and folkways of Sholoshaidi, her people's image made manifest in abstract form. Though he had climbed its titanic flanks before in the shadow of his mother and her courtly priests, Ichtok's current trip, alone save for the silence sworn Ektal vigilance posted every nineteen steps along the ascent, and the eyes of the countless thousands weighing on his distant back sent shivers down his spine. Though the dull pain of his recent injuries made the climb an agony by its end, he did not allow himself to stop, each pace a test of his will, his grit teeth clamped against the thought of surrender. Sensations like that were best savored, he knew, for there could be only one certainty as to what awaited him atop the pyramid— and it was far worse than aching ribs and weeping nerve endings. Centering the ritual platform, itself large enough to host thousands, the eternal fire crackled high in its mighty pit. It burned a surreal turquoise like so many of the ghost lights and chandeliers of the ancient palace below. Its sorcerous flame had been tended and fed by the priesthood for millennia, its volcanic smoke emanating from the angular crest of the roof above. The monument's peak was far above the lip of the great chasm in which Tepeclan set, so that the glow of this immortal flame was visible across not just the capital, but also the arid highlands sprawling out around it. With the highland desert horizon cast in the dark, rich hues of the coming evening, the last of the day's harshest heat wafting in hazy waves up from the distant earth, the panorama that met the prince atop Shahuitzul seemed ephemeral, almost otherworldly. Cresting the steps, he was faced with the western descent opposite him, partially visible through the dancing fire. The falling sun framed beyond painted the awesome sweep of Tepeclan's vast cenote lake, and the celebrating city surrounding it in an otherworldly orange glaze. He did his best to focus on these aesthetic marvels, for the slight figure flanked by storied priests amidst temple guardians and sacrificial rebel captives at the base of that great eternal flame was anything but heavenly to him. Her presence sucked from his chest the warm pride the climb had breathed into him, leaving only shame alongside a child's pedantic fear. Each talk bowed low before the flame the moment he cleared the final step, murmuring the rites of humility before Harakwe and clutching his crossed palms to his chest in deference. Rising, he advanced 380 paces with his arms held wide before again signaling his humility, this time falling to his knees, bending his head towards the flame, and placing his hands palms up on the cool stone. Each and every move had been practiced countless times over in his head, echoed as best he could manage from photographs, readings, and his foggy recollections of prior rituals. 
but their perfection had roots outside of study. Outside observers might take the calculated and graceful movements of the prince for fearless faith or hard-earned discipline, but each talk held no illusions that it was anything other than the omnipresent gaze of the Tlatoani that kept him in perfect form. Each step, each twitch, each intake of air, her eyes missed nothing. This he knew as surely as he knew the sun would rise again after the night's quiet reprieve as surely as he knew that mild autumn would follow the scorching highland summer. So engrossed was he with worrying over his mother's presence that, despite the few rituals he had witnessed in childhood from amongst the priests now between him and the fire, the voice of High Priest Shakoat, Imperial Bloodletter, High Inquisitor, and Speaker of the Word in Tepeklan, gave him a jolt of nervous surprise. It was the first such minuscule misstep he had made, and he gritted his teeth and steeled himself in determination not to do so again. Harakwe has showed you more than a little favor, Shakoat said from above the kowtowing prince, his voice the wise and measured tone of a near-ancient priest whose craft has long been perfected, somehow both booming and soothing. Victorious, living, and left with a scar to mirror the old general's own. They were casual words, words each talk was not prepared for. Shakoat's voice had come to mean shame to him over his recent years spent atoning for sins of the flesh, his mother's favorite tutor to sick on him in the earliest hours of the morning when he was unprepared and undefended. This was not the tone that had scored intrusions into his private chambers with ancient scripture in hand. Now, the priest's speech was weighty with pride as he listed his blessings. For the first time, he could share in the comfort and certainty of the high priest's words. We call you, son of Tepeklan, home to your city to receive another blessing in the name of the old general. Let these be the first among many. With that, a warm wetness came over the prince's forehead, the priest's steady hand tracing the unblinking eye of Harakwe upon his flesh and blood. He could scent its iron bite through his nose now over even the smoke of the fire, and realized the sacrifices must already be underway on the other side of the blaze's muted roar. The felines met their ends silently, like warriors, both those whose Lautani clans practiced the traditionally Sholushaitian faith of Harakwe, and those that followed the old ways of the Lautan archipelago, of the fire and the sea. Worthy foes all, he thought, fighting the urge to raise his living eye to look upon them as the priest's ritual continued. Two thousand and forty-nine souls, Shakoat announced, rising from his work to face the group gathered around the watching Tlatoani, just outside each talk's view. A great tally to capture for an army led by one so young, a shining star for the people of Lake Tepeklan to follow in their darkest hours. The priest turned once more, having gingerly accepted a cup of gold inlaid ivory from a temple attendant, and swept up to each talk, kneeling down before him. The proffered vessel's bone-white innards were slick with the thick and vein-warm bite of sacrificial blood, its metallic stink immediately drawing his mind's eye back to the smoky, frightful streets of Eztlan. Each talk, practiced with these honored offerings, did not hesitate in memory, and drank deep. The priest fed him as a doting mother might a sick toddler and the prince struggled not to falter in his task until every bitter, metallic drop was spent, a final test of his will before the keen eyes gathered round the flame. Then, the red-hot brand was brought forward from the pit. It was a straight-edged triskelion, sized perfectly to fit Ichtok's right palm, his sword hand. Shakoat held firm Ichtok's wrist, and two other priests performed the branding, searing the symbol of Harakwe into the soft flesh of the outstretched palm, a testament scrawled in scar tissue that Ichtok the Sixth had spilled the blood of his foemen in battle. 
The stink of his own burning skin filled his nostrils, but Ichtok didn't care. More than his passage into manhood at nineteen, or any one of a hundred smaller rites he'd undergone over his short count of years, this proved his worth. A man might be Sholoshaitian by birth, but he was not Sholoshaitian by deed until the Triskelion had been seared into his palm by the speakers of Harakwe. Rise, Ichtok the Sixth, Shakoat called, his voice swelling to be carried by intricate architecture from the temple's peak to the crowds in the Grand Causeway, his powerful tones booming off the far walls of the crater city. Let this be the last time you kneel before anyone save your Tlatawani and your god. Ichtak obeyed, and as he took to his feet, the crowd looking on from around him chanted the words, K Tlatawani, K Tlatokayot, K Tlashashitli, in practiced unison. The men among them who were of noble or military extraction, old and young, held their own palms aloft, fingers splayed, displaying the brands they bore. The words were old Sholoshaitian, a powerful credo. One Tlatoani, one empire, one legion. Each man and woman present on the platform, whether priest, officer, or business magnate, cautiously nursed each syllable. Their sound spilled down into the city like lines spoken in a great amphitheater, and spurred the masses to join them. Roared from below on the city's streets, the masses of Sholoshaiti's greatest holdfast chanted the same words, their echoed calls sounding for all the world like some ominous, awesome storm breaking loose. Though only those farthest from Shahuitzul's base could see the fire in the outlines of the prince and priests about it, they rumbled with the fury of a rising wave. The weight of those words, and the weight they lent the very concept of the land to which he had been born, sent the shivers of awe through him once again. As the crowds finished and erupted into raucous applause and fanfare, Ichtak was guided by Shakawat's gentle hand into full view of the citizenry once more. Small as the pair must have been from so far below, the prince drew their adulation ever higher as his guide raised his marked hand high, like a duelist being proclaimed the victor in an arena. The masses of Tepeklan returned the gesture, with almost every man in the metropolis holding aloft his dominant palm to display his own brand in turn. Gold and black Triskelion banners dancing above their roiling ranks like debris on a windswept tide. Ichtok's eye played over the saluting crowd, his heart drumming in his aching chest. Despite his guilt at having survived Estlan, which still crouched low in his gut like a coiled snake biding its time, he was more at one with himself there atop the temple than perhaps he had ever been. If there was one thing no shame or guilt could strip from him, it was his love of his home, of her rhythms and moods and poem, story, and verse, of her indomitable aesthetics in stone, tapestry, and flesh, of her flower and song, of her unity in the face of a hostile world. In the calls of the crowd, he felt every shadowed shame of his missteps momentarily stripped away, a leaden weight rising from his tired shoulders. At the sight of the soldiers who he had, with gracious and devastating help, commanded in the field at Estlan receiving the adulation of the throng, many of the youngest among them displaying their own fresh brands of faith, he knew nothing could dull the beauty of the day. Their uniformed ranks mixed with those of the citizenry as the ceremony came to an end, and the true homecoming revelry began. Families found sons, and husbands found wives and children in the tumult. The masses on the far side of Shahuitzul, along the shores of Lake Tepeklan, watched the lowering of the Sholoshaitian dead into the sunset-lit waters of the Cenote Lake saluting or chanting at their honorable departure. Heroes all, finally rewarded, each talk smiling to hear the indecipherable rapture upon the distant streets. 
So great was his meditative calm there that when the cool voice behind him sounded just past his shoulder, the chills to which he had grown accustomed did not roll down his spine. You've made even your namesake each tack the first proud, I'm sure. They were simple words, but their weight was not lost on him, for as pious a soul as his mother to liken his deeds to his namesake, the ancient and revered prophet and conqueror king who had birthed their line, was no small thing. He, lustful and broken as he was by the standards of the great Tlatoani of old, had never expected to hear her speak such words. Turning, he came face to face with her, some remote part of his mind expecting a sudden bout of venomous words which did not come. When the midwives took you from me and removed your call to anoint you with the blood of warriors, they proclaimed you now belonged not to me, but to the battlefield, the Tlatoani said, bright crystalline eyes which mirrored his own to a haunting degree gripping him in place. It's a thing of tradition, spoken over every boy born to daughters of Sholushaidi. Few so young can claim to have proven it accurate. Her hand gloved in a rich leather so dark it might have been black, met his bare shoulder, the touch ephemeral. The long garment of office she wore, more military greatcoat than noble dress, flared around the torso and shoulders, the wing-like sweep of dark gold inlaid fabric, making a slender frame look almost skeletal. Even with the added height of a substantial royal headdress, its center decorated with a gold bat's head wreathed in the rich yellow plumes of coastal parrots, the monarch was dwarfed by the towering warrior her son had become. That did not keep him from feeling every ounce of the force of will etched into her angular features as she lowered the veil of office which masked her muzzle, showing her full visage to him for the first time in over a decade. They stood there a moment, strangers reacquainting themselves with one another, before she said, let's not allow shame to keep us apart. Ijtak raised his own hand to her shoulder, completing the circuit, and bowed his head in silent acceptance. She smiled her stifled smile, an expression he heard in her tone more than saw, and brought her hand down to his chest, placing her knuckles over his heart. All is forgiven. Her hand withdrew, and each talk heard the rustle of the veil rising into its traditional place once more. They parted, the prince left with just a little less doubt to mar his newfound pride while he watched the sunset's finale over the far side of the temple peak in the company of the capital's elite. What, if anything, the words of his mother about forgiveness meant in the grand scheme of his life was anathema to him. Certainly they did nothing to excuse his past missteps, and the threat of future addendums were clearly veiled behind those refined words of praise, but in that short moment of second chances hard won, he did not worry over such things, and let himself briefly forget his shortcomings, and think well of the future. All the while, the heartless bodies of the rebel dead rolled down the vast, blood-slick western stairway, to crash into the waters of the cenote lake below. <laughs>